Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the London's Pretty Cool podcast. Today, we are speaking with Karen Oldman and Julie Ryan from Neighborhood Decision Making. This episode is a little bit different. This is a mini episode because it is a two part episode. Neighborhood Decision Making is a program in which Londoners are able to come up with ideas to improve their local communities. You're able to submit your ideas and get your community to vote on which ideas you all want to see come to life because you know what is needed in your neighborhood better than anyone. This is part one because submissions close September 21st. This part is all about submitting your ideas. We want to encourage our listeners to submit your ideas for your neighborhood before the submissions close. In part two, we will showcase the ideas that are up for vote in each neighborhood so you know what you're able to vote for and also how to go about doing that. Remember to rate and subscribe and all those fun things and follow us on social media to know when part two is out. My name is Aaron Briggs. And I'm Patrick Briggs. And we are here with Karen Oldman, the manager of the Neighborhood Decision Making Program here in London, Ontario, and Julie Ryan, who is a previous winner of the Neighborhood, London, Neighborhood Decision Making uh, Program. And we are excited to kind of talk to them about what it is, get some ideas about some past projects, and just kind of encourage everyone to get out, put some ideas in, and really make a difference in their neighborhoods. So welcome, Karen and Julie. Thanks so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Thanks, Thanks. For happy to be here. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about the Neighborhood Decision Making Program? Like, when did you start this? How did it, the idea come to be? Um, I guess that'll be me. And uh, so back in 2015, 16, we had a counselor who was really interested in having people have a say for some of council's budget. Um, and basically, it's a bit of a participatory budgeting process, but what would people want in their neighborhoods if they could have anything you know added to their neighborhood so that's kind of how it started and it's rolled into a citywide um, allocation of funding for 250,000 per year um, we've divided the city into five quintiles I don't know if that's a real world <laughs> we call it that um, and so we have Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, Southwest, and Central, and each one of those quintiles has $50,000 to spend, if you will. Um, and so residents are invited to submit ideas of anything under the sun. We will sort of go through those ideas and mark them feasible or not feasible, um, up to spending a cap of $30,000. And so... Um, if they are feasible ideas, they get onto a ballot and Londoners vote for their favorite ideas. And if they're in the top um, of the voting, then they get implemented the next year. That is so cool. Uh, how, how did you decide to uh, split up the neighborhoods, by the way? Like, um, uh, I must just obviously be North, South, East, West all that, but is like, we are the city of neighborhoods. So did that come into play at all? Definitely. So it's a really good question. It took a lot of time for us to sort of figure out what the boundaries would be. Um, we had to consider how many people lived in each one of those quintiles. We had to consider where neighborhood associations draw their line because we didn't want to mm -hmm. split up groups um, mm -hmm. of neighborhood associations. There's major boundaries like Wellington Road is sort of a, a major, you know, you don't really cross that typically. Rivers, those kinds of things. So all of that was considered. Um, population is obviously important because we're spending $50,000 per area and we want to make sure that it's equitably distributed. I love this. I love this. <laughs> um, you're right. That is, uh, you can, if anything under the sun is like you said, is so interesting. Could you maybe give us an example of uh, some past winning projects? Sure. Um, so we've, we've been doing this for four years now and 
every year things get more creative, but I, I feel like Londoners would recognize some of the projects. Um, and certainly Julie will be talking about hers, which Londoners probably drive by um, fairly frequently, but we've had everything from bat boxes, little libraries, skating rinks, basketball courts, benches. So there's big projects, there's small projects. Um, something that probably Londoners would note would be the mosaic in Old East Village. Um, uh, I that love that. Part of, mm -hmm. part of NDM, I call NDM, Neighborhood Decision Making. <laughs> Um, so lots of different ideas. People love their parks and I mm -hmm. feel like this year more than ever people are looking at their their neighborhood from a perspective of we go walking every day. We've been sort of cooped up through the pandemic and so neighborhoods have become very important. Um, so we're, we're seeing a lot of submissions this year for things in parks. Mm -hmm. So it seems like there's Right now, it's like, oh, anything under the sun. But is there things that you can't, like, uh, submit ideas for that it's like, this isn't going to work out? So maybe don't put your time and effort into putting those down? Yeah, that's um, that's a good, good call. Uh, so basically, we're looking at this as a community building project. So we're looking for residents to get together in their neighborhoods or their communities. To come up with ideas that's going to build a lot of community and goodwill. Um, we're not able to fund an organization for their, you know, staff salaries, for example. If they wanted to grow their organization and pay staff, we can't do that. Or we wouldn't um, be looking at any events that would have alcohol or gambling or those, those types of things. Um, we look at you know, we look at the idea as in, can a lot of people benefit? Is it on public property? Is it accessible? Um, we don't want to see that there's a fee attached for people to participate. Um, and it's part of why we want to fund things so that there isn't, you know, any barriers to participation. So. I love that. I love that, that you want to make sure that uh, there's no barriers to participation. That's so key when it comes to um, projects involving the community, especially you want every single person to be involved in this. Um, what are some of the most popular types of ideas that usually succeed or, or at the very least get submitted for, for something like this? That's a good question. We get a lot of different things, but I would say we get a lot of um, amenities in parks and so people would like a basketball court for example I think we you know we have so many things in our parks we're extremely lucky as Londoners that often I have to say no to some of the submissions because there's so many things already in a park there's a baseball field there's a soccer field a playground equipment a, you know pathways People want to add, add disc golf. That seems to be really popular this year, but we have to find the yeah. right park for that because you need, you can't be throwing a disc across a pathway and knocking out the people walking over. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so really popular pollinator gardens are very popular. And nice. what I would like to say about those is while we love them, they are high maintenance, so if they're going in a public space, we need people to also step up to say they'll maintain them. Mm. Um, we're really uh, encouraging people to think about our ESA, our, in, our environmentally significant areas and the natural areas and adding you know, plants to those for our pollinators. So um, that's been really popular this year as well. Um, what else? Ha we, we haven't seen a lot of art, which, you know, Julie can talk about in a minute, but we haven't seen a lot of that yet this year, and I'm hoping we'll see more. We've had someone um, thought of, you know, painting garbage cans so that those boring, plain, black garbage cans might have a little personality around the city, um, which is a great, great submission, really, so... Um, yeah, it's so fun to read what people are thinking of and it's, it's really disappointing for us as city staff when we have to say no because maybe it's on a floodplain or maybe it's, 
you know, the park is too full and um, we'd like to say yes to everything. It's actually a little bit of a goal, like how can we tweak it so it'll fit? But it's very, it's difficult for sure. Yeah, you kind of, oh, sorry. It's hard on Zoom. We don't know if things are <laughs> lagging or anything. Uh, so you kind of went over, because submissions are currently open for people to submit ideas, and you kind of gave some types of ideas that have been submitted this year, but do you think COVID has impacted the types of ideas that people are uh, putting forward this year? It's a good question. I think, you know, my team is all about supporting residents and neighborhoods, and over the last year and a half, we've really been shut down, which has been disappointing. Um, we wanted to support people, but it's been amazing to see what neighborhoods have done. If you think about kindness rocks and signs and windows and, you know, decorating trees and all kinds of community things have happened, which has been really phenomenal. Um, those aren't the types of things that we're seeing. I, I would encourage people to think about events, but we're still hesitant, you know, to to gather, which is totally fair. So we aren't seeing a lot of, of the gathering events this year. I think we're seeing, like I said, am amenities in parks because those are in people's neighborhoods and they're walking a lot. Um, environmental um, projects are, are pretty big because that's also an issue for us is thinking about um, our environment and how to make it, you know, healthier. So um, so I, I do think COVID has played a, played a factor for sure. And I also think we've had more submissions to date than we would normally have in another year. So I don't know if it's because we weren't able to run the program last year and people have been dreaming for two years now about what they want to see in their neighborhood. So we, we're getting more submissions than we would normally have. I love that too. Uh, more submissions is a good thing. It must be difficult. How many people do you have uh, going through the submissions? Like to work on feasibility? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's, there's quite a few people internally to the city, but if someone were to submit something, let's just say in a church parking lot, because it could be accessible to public, so it would still qualify we would then have to go to the church to say, is this feasible for you? So there's oh, there's a team, uh, my team is only three people at the moment, so we're very, very busy. But then we rely on all, all of our internal staff experts, different service areas, but also like we've had people wanting to wrap or paint bell, bell boxes or, you know, traffic mm -hmm. boxes. And so then we would take into consideration art and you know bell as a company or so we we have to reach out to a lot of different people to see if these things are feasible on average how many submissions do you guys normally get per year um it's fluctuated over the last four years i would say on average 175 maybe so like how many per neighborhood like do you find that one uh, of the areas gets way more submissions than the some other ones? Yeah, really good question. Uh, Central definitely uh, has the most submissions and you know there's a lot of neighborhood associations in Central. People are participating pretty heavily in their neighborhood which is awesome. Um, so yeah, I would say Central has, usually their ballot has you know, 30 or 40 ideas on it versus some of the other ones might only have 17, 18. Yeah, we were, we were in Central and I remember thinking that, wow, we, we have so much competition and uh, <laughs> we felt really fortunate that, uh, that we got the votes to, uh, to go forward. That's amazing. I, I was actually, I don't know if we've clarified this and maybe I, maybe I'm just forgetting. Is there multiple winners a year because you can divvy up certain like uh, the funds and everything? Yes. Yeah, really. Um, so because there's 50,000 and the cap on an idea is 30, there's at least two. <laughs> but mm -hmm. typically there would be five, six, seven ideas. Um, and I think people, it's a good thing for people to think about because e sometimes those really small ideas, like maybe you only need $500 for something, 
like a little library where you're building something on the end of your, you know, lawn. Um, those ones often get funded because we spend out the 50,000. So if an idea is taking up 30,000 and then there's 20 left, what is the next thing we can, you know, do with the 20,000? And as you go down, um, sometimes it's, it's an idea that just doesn't cost a lot of money that will get funded. Very cool. Very cool. So I love the idea of, um, so that means that uh, things like a public, um, what do they call that little public library on your, on your lawn when they, when they uh, set those yeah. up, they have that in my neighborhood. I love that. So um, that's a publicly funded thing as well. That's very interesting. Sometimes it's not always a lot of people will just do that, but that is something that they can apply mm -hmm. to um, submit for NDM. Very cool. Um, we are talking about obviously a lot of the positive things already about uh, this project, but um, how does this project have a positive impact on local neighborhoods? Well, number one, it sort of forces people to talk to each other to find out what they want to happen in their neighborhood. So it's, it's an excuse, right, to go knocking on doors and saying, hi, I'm you know, I'm Karen and I live in your neighborhood and I want to participate in this program. Are you thinking of anything? So that really sparks people to talk to each other and, um, you know, come to some sort of agreement or vision what, what they want for their neighborhood. And then um, the voting is the same way. They have to sort of rally their neighbors, their maybe their church community or their um, different associations to vote for their idea. So it's a lot of communication and excuse to talk to each other. So for me, it's all about relationship building. And I think that this program does promote um, relationship building between neighbors or community members. And, and that's really important. And I would add that it's empowering. Um, I mean, the project that, that we did is something I've been wanting to do for about 10 years. <laughs> I just, and I, I never saw a path to get it done until um, this came about and I said, hey, here's, I can finally try to get this, this, this done. And so, um, yeah, it's empowering to, to be able to put something forward, get your neighbors to vote on it, and then make it happen. Mm -hmm. Why don't we get into that right now? Uh, uh, Julie, what, uh, what was the project that had you uh, succeed and get your, uh, this, this years long dream come true? Uh, the project is the Richmond uh, underpass murals. Um, so if you know the CN line and Richmond street between York and <coughs> Horton, um, is uh, not a very pleasant place to walk. Um, and I walked it every day. I, walk, I live downtown, I live in, I, I'm sorry, I live in Old South and I work downtown. And so I go down, I take that path all the time um, when I'm going um, to work and then on the weekends if I'm going to something downtown. And it just seemed like there was so much potential there. And if you look at it, if you've never seen it, um, please go by and, and see it, um, but it's also online and we can, I can tell you that. Um, what's so cool about it is that there are, there are actually um, frames uh, along the underpass. It's almost as if it was set up to be this under this lovely little gallery and that's what we've turned it into. Um, so um, uh, as envisioned, it was going to be a murals and um, I met uh, a, an artist named Melanie Schombach um, and uh, we, we were both working at Innovation Works, and I found out that she does these participatory murals. And I said, oh, you're just the person that, that could help me with this mural. And I showed it, you know, we walked down there, and then six months later, I saw the neighborhood decision-making, and I got back in touch with Melanie, and I said, do you want to apply for this? So we got together with her and also um, Alejandro Zaga, who, um, uh, uh, and we put the, the, <clears throat> pre the kind of package together. It's a pretty easy um, application. Um, and, uh, and, and then we rallied the votes. 
one of the things I'll tell you, tip, tip for those who are going to apply, um, we had about 18 nonprofit organizations that we recruited to be partners in this project. Um, and the way that Melanie and Alejandro work is um, by, by getting people involved. And so, um, so, of course, once they were partners, we said, hey, get everybody to vote for this, right? Um, and so that's one of the ways that we were able to, um, to, get, to get votes. Um, yeah, so that's how it all started. Um, and uh, the way it was supposed to roll out um, was that there was going to be a series of workshops and we were going to bring in different groups to work together and there were very disparate groups. Um, you know, we had um, uh, uh, the Men's Mission and, and the Boys and Girls Club and, and the International School and um, uh, the um, uh, Participation House. I mean, just, um, and the Thames Valley District School Board, tons of different partners. So we were going to bring people together and have them work together um, uh, to uh, create in person um, these murals, and each one is about four feet by six feet, and we were going to do 13 of them. Um, so that was, um, we got started, we won it in the fall, right, Karen, of 2019, and then we were going to get started in January of 2020, and we had one, and then the rest were scheduled for uh, April, May, June, and then guess what happened? <laughs> All the world shut down so yeah. it, it slowed down a little bit is it? yeah it was like what are we going to do because we had this money we had this project we had all these people who were excited to do it and we you know i was certain well we'll just postpone it to the fall well <laughs> that wouldn't have worked i mean and i'm glad that we didn't postpone it to the fall um and really ryan craven who's part of um karen's team said, you know, and oh, but first, Melanie and Alejandro said, you know what, we can do this online. And I thought, how can you do art online? Um, but, um, you know, they said, we can do it. We, you know, we want to do it. And Ryan Craven said, you know, it's going to be to have a project like this done during this awful time and, and sort of recorded on our city walls would be pretty extraordinary. Um, and so we decided to go ahead. Um, and um, Melanie and Alejandro were incredible. They brought, um, I think there were just over, under 100 people who said, yeah, we'll, I'll do this. They did meetups. They had special guests. We did art on our own. We did art together. We did storytelling. We um, did music, dancing, writing, everything. They just did all of this wonderful um, uh, groups sort of um, uh, coming together to express different ideas, um, stories about our own background, the diversity, what does it mean to belong. Um, so we explored all of that together. And then they created some themes. Um, Melanie and Alejandro created uh, 13 themes and assigned each theme to a panel um, and themes like um, beauty and diversity, um, speaking truth to power, um, uh, trying to remember some of the others. Um, and each, each theme had um, a different art medium like um, watercolor or uh, photography or um, uh, um, actual uh, textiles. Um, and so you could choose then what you were interested in. Um, and some people chose to be in more than one group. And if you didn't have a lot of time, maybe you just chose one group. Um, and then the, the facilitating continued and we got down to what, is our, what, are, what images are we going to do? So this participatory art um, project seems like kind of like, how does this really work? Um, but Melanie is just magic and so she was able to take people's ideas and then she created um, sketches um, and then we did actual art like I did a watercolor because um, I was in the watercolor group other people 
did knitting, other people took photography, other people did digital art. And then Melanie took all of that and stitched it all together into these murals. Um, and they're just quite extraordinary. There's so much to them. Um, you can spend hours down there just <laughs> at the different um, at the different panels. Um, uh, so that's that's the that's that's part of the story. I mean, um, it was I think it was just such a necessary. It was such a helpful thing for so many people during that time, that awful summer where we were kind mm -hmm. of scared and alone and not knowing what was coming. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Sorry, go ahead, Erin. <laughs> uh, it's just great to hear how much collaboration was done to put these murals together, especially like in London and in this COVID time, when you're not able to connect and see those people that you normally do, to hear all this collaboration that was going on to make these murals. So if anyone's going down Richmond, they can go check it out and know how much uh, how many people and how much passion was put behind figuring out exactly what should be going in these spaces down there. It definitely yeah. brightens it up a bit too, just to say. <laughs> yeah, have you seen it? It's yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's fun. The other thing that was kind of neat about the project was, so we had the murals installed on the wall, but then the walls themselves were kind of grimy and gross and they were all painted this sort of this beigey color that I think the city must have gallons and gallons of paint so they can quickly cover up the graffiti as it gets as it gets put on on different walls. But so um, so we did a backdrop. But the the walls, I mean that um, underpass is a hundred years old, right? So um, those walls have probably been painted a hundred times, and um, so we we. We created in the fall, remember things last year kind of opened up enough, so we were able to put together some um, parties, if you will, work parties, to scrape the paint, wash the paint. We got pathways, it was wonderful. They came out and, and power washed the, the stalactites off the ceiling and the walls, and, and then we scraped and paint, and then the city came and put this beautiful yellow background, and then Melanie drew this sort of flowing river all the way through and we all came and painted. So that was, that brought in even more people. So there were the kind of the people that were doing the online stuff. Some of those folks came out, but then other people came out and just, uh, and did the painting. Um, so that was a lot of fun to be together and to meet some of the people that you'd seen online all summer long um, and, uh, and, and sort of get all of that done. Um, and then the panels were printed on like an aluminum with a vinyl cover, um, which was something that uh, Melanie hadn't, hadn't done before. Um, you know, most of her work was done on canvases or, you know, in person. So, um, so that was something new. Um, and then we installed them and we had another sort of outdoor unveiling party. We actually had did two of them because we didn't want to have too many people. We had to do two back to back and we had a bad pipe that brought us down from innovation from the parking lot of innovation works <laughs> to the uh to the murals to do an unveiling and it was it was um really neat to um to be able to see it come to fruition and and of course now every day when i walk to work i, I smile when i <laughs> will underpass totally changed your the morning that you've had for years now every yeah, you get to go to work with a smile. That's awesome. And yeah. home. Yeah, that's right. And so for our listeners who are now hearing this amazing project and are like, I want to do that, how can they uh, submit their ideas to the neighborhood decision making? And like, when's the last date to be able to get all their ducks in a row and talk to their neighbors and get it going? So they need to visit getinvolved.london.ca backslash NDM. Um, it has all, it has our past winners on there and some ideas for new projects, um, the guidelines that we talked about earlier, um, and a great big submit button. Um, when they hit that, it brings them to the application process. So they do have to make a bit of a profile. It's pretty easy. And then they fill out the application. 
Uh, our last date for submissions is September 21st. So we've got a couple of weeks still. And, uh, and my team does a lot of back and forth with people. Um, it's basically what we do all day right now. <laughs> um, talking to people about just getting a little more specific or if our feasibility team is asking questions, then we get back to them about that or budget, et cetera. Um, so once we do all that, and if their idea is feasible, then um, we make a one pager for them that we'll put online October 18th. So people can go and look at all of those ideas that will be on the ballots upcoming in the five different areas. Um, and then vote day will happen on November 6th. So. Perfect. Before yeah, so we get, oh, sorry, go ahead, Erin. No, I was <laughs> just going to say, uh, uh, just so our listeners do know, we are going to do another little mini episode closer to the vote date and go over all of the submissions that are like in each uh, neighborhood so they'll know what they're able to vote for. So try and get involved. If you don't have an idea, wait for that and you're able to vote for something in your neighborhood. For sure, yeah. And I'll, I'll just add too that this is for all ages. So, you know, we've definitely had kids in the past putting in some really interesting projects um, and we want to hear from children, older adults, everyone in between. Um, it's for everyone and everyone can vote. We don't have any criteria on that either. So it's really something that all Londoners can get involved. Yeah, we understand you want to uh, encourage a uh, uh, encourage Londoners, Londoners of all ages to participate in a democratic voting process. Do you, is that exactly what you were kind of referring to right there or did you want to elaborate a bit further? Yeah, no, for sure. I think this is an opportunity for kids to see like what does voting mean and there are future, you know, um, voters. And so if we can get them sort of used to what that means now, hopefully they will vote in the future because it's obviously very important to have them come out. Um, and vote for their um, their ward councillors, their mayor, et cetera, um, municipally anyway. And so this is a really good teaching tool for that. Um, it's also super educational for every age to know that, that things cost X amount of money or have this much maintenance involved. And so mm -hmm. it gives them a little inside look at what city staff are you know, involved in and working towards, and it's not always like, you know, a picnic table isn't actually a hundred dollars. It's more like 2000 because we have to put it on a cement pad and make it accessible. And so mm. there's lots of um, back and forth in education, which is great. I love that. I just learned so much just right there. <laughs> so yeah, that's fantastic. I hope that everybody gets the opportunity to take, to have a, a takeaway not only of, you know, my community gets to get involved in something bigger than we thought we were capable of, but also just educating ourselves on, uh, on future processes for our, for our kids and everything. So that's pretty incredible. I love that. Now, uh, before we get into um, our, our classic this or that <laughs> questionnaire, where we are going to ask you guys to do, you know, uh, uh, do some London-based this or that, um, is there anything else you wanted to discuss with our listeners before we go? Just I would encourage people to, to, to bring your, for your idea forward and, and go for it, because um, it's pretty exciting when... Uh, a change that you want to see in your neighborhood uh, actually happens and the benefits go beyond the thing that you do because I made friendships and we got together this summer and and cleaned up and painted you know repainted and and uh, and and you know it's it's a community now of people that didn't know each other very well before or at all and now we're um, we're connected. We still are on a Facebook group. There's a there's a website connected in chaos.ca um, where uh, you can you can even check out the uh, murals online. Very cool. Very cool for even the people who might be listening that aren't in London. If there if there are those listeners, definitely take a look online or come visit. 
All right, so we're gonna get into our classic game, this or that. Uh, should I say uh, this or that? that. With the so, lag, it's o with the lag, it's always so fun to try and do. <laughs> our uh, so in this game, we're gonna give you two options of London kind of things that are pretty similar. So you'll have to choose your favorite. It is pretty difficult. Uh, some people have a lot of trouble with it, but trying to go with it, no explanation needed. Just first thing that comes to your head, your choice, you say it. Sound good? Okay. Got it. All right, starting off, Western Fair Market or Coven Garden Market? Western Fair. Western Fair. I go to both though. Uh, Sunfest or Home County? Sunfest. Sunfest. Sunfest is great, but I also love Home County, I agree. Yeah, I do too. Uh, Masonville Mall or White Oaks Mall? Masonville Mall because I live on that end. Mm. No other reason. I hate malls, so sorry. No answer there. That's that's totally appropriate. Uh, Dundas East or Richmond Row? Dundas East. Yeah, I would go with Dundas East too. Uh, Spring Bank Park or Gibbons Park? Mm. Gibbons Park. Spring Bank. Uh, Fanshawe or Western University? Mm. I went to Western. <laughs> <laughs> Holding the W. Well, my daughter's a, a Fanshawe student, so I'll say Fanshawe. <laughs> I was also a Fanshawe student, so respect. I, I don't think we have an F or anything that we can do. But <laughs> uh, for the music lovers, some Odyssey records or Grooves records? Grooves. Grooves. Have me wearing a groove shirt right now. That's so funny. There you go. Uh, for our book lovers, Brown and Dixon or City Lights? Brown and Dixon. I'm going to go City of City Lights. I haven't actually been to either, but heard, mm. heard a lot about both. Uh, would you rather bike on the Thames Valley Parkway or hike one of our trails in our environmentally significant areas? Hike. Mm. Did you say hike or bike, Julie? I said hike, hike a trail. Hike. I would probably bike. <laughs> mm. Both are really great options in this city. We have such amazing trails and pathways. It's ridiculous. Yes. Mm -hmm. For our last one here, for our, we are a, a city with tons of great local breweries. We're gonna just do two here. London Brewing Co-op or Anderson Craft Ales? Mm. London Brewing Co-op. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't choose. Yeah. I like them both. I'll say Anderson if I have to pick, but I like them both. I'm going to say London. Oh. oh, Karen, I think we lost you there. Sorry about that. I, I hit my keyboard. Um, I was just there and had, there was live music and I danced for the first time in two years. So I was so excited to be there and dancing. I was going to say, when was that? Was that just recently? Very recent. Yeah. Was it on Friday? Because I was going to say my boyfriend's band played on Friday of this it week. It was a so. Thursday. And oh. I don't, people who don't maybe don't know Diana Clark, but she's our parks manager. It was her brother that was playing um, for her partner's birthday. So it was pretty awesome. Oh, Very nice. Cool. Oh. That's awesome. I want to dance now. You're inspiring yeah. me. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for taking the time this evening. And we're so happy that you would like, uh, excuse me, we're so happy that you uh, have trusted us to help, you know, send the great message of this uh, project throughout the city. Uh, and we're going to do our best to make sure more and more people participate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Terrific. Yeah, thank, thanks so much for highlighting this uh, neighborhood decision making. It's a, it's a great program. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm Julie Ryan. And I'm Karen Oldham. From Neighborhood Decision Making. You're listening to London's Pretty Cool Podcast. Woo! Yeah! yeah. yeah. <laughs>